I'd like to ask you, what's the most amazing fact of the human body? You ever thought about that? What makes the human body so amazing? And talking about that, what's the most amazing feat that any human body has done? Talking about that. So looked into that a little bit. Let's talk about the most amazing fact of the human body. You know, the, the, the human body can uh, repair itself. Ever got a cut, heal itself? Uh, wound your eye to be able to heal itself? So God made our body remarkably that it can heal itself. And then the brain is more active sleeping than awake. Did you realize that? Now, for some of you, you might say, yeah, I know people it works for, okay? It seems like they're smarter when they're sleeping and they're awake. But it's true. The brain's more active sleeping and awake. And a human heart beats more than three billion times in the lifespan. So if you live the normal life three billion times, for some people less, for some people more, 100,000 miles of blood vessels. Ever thought about that in our body? And when you wink, one one hundredth of a second. That's, that's how long it takes to wink. So the body is pretty amazing. But I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you about feats that the human body has done. Felix Baumgartner. He, he was skydiving. He was up 31 kilometers in the air, and he was clocked going 1,000 miles an hour. That's like the speed of sound. He skydived. He lived through it. And then William Pruitt, he did this. Now, he did three Ironmans, complete Ironmans, back to back to back each day, total of 660 miles biking, 120 miles running, and 12 miles swimming. Just back to back. 660 riding, 120 running, 12 swimming. Holy cow. George Horn, I like this one. He spun for 222 hours, 22 minutes, and 22 seconds without stopping. You guys ever take a spin class when I mean in the gym? Let me say it again. 222 hours. Okay. And then there is, uh, I like this, Alex Vandell. He held his breath. You know how long he held his breath underwater for? 24 minutes and 3 seconds. He lived. Whew. That's true. Uh, John Hotham, he caught 33 50-pound cannonballs that are blown off from a cannon. True. He caught 33 of them. Of course, he lost three of his fingers in the process, but it's a true story. He lost three of his fingers, but he caught 50-pound cannonballs. And one more, um, Phil Petit, he tightroped a couple times uh, between the, the top of the, the Twin Towers. Uh, there's a movie called The Walk. I'll go ahead and run it. It's a pretty cool movie. Pretty scary watching it. These are feats done by the human body, right? And so the psalmist says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Can you all read this with me from Dr. Martin Luther? I... Yes, and so Martin Luther, as the first article says, God made me in all things, God the Father, Creator, uh, our bodies wonderful, awesome made that can do very complex things. And so in Genesis 1 to 2, we hear it in different ways uh, that God made them male and female, and he made us in his own image. That means we have a brain, we have a reason, we have emotions, uh, we can love, we can cry, uh, we have a spirit, we know right from wrong, we have morality. And then God said this, for all stuff made, God called it what? He called it what? And so God made our bodies good. And so our bodies are a gift from God. We talked about the feats. We talked about how wonderful our body is. And the psalmist once again says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, there's two errors that you and I were constantly confronted with in modern American society. And the first one's naturalism. Now, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take that into the vernacular. It's called evolution. And what evolution teaches, naturalism teaches, is that the only thing there is is nature. And so the only thing we have is our body, because when our body dies, there's nothing else. The only thing we have is nature. And we only get one body to live, and that's how it is. And so naturalism is an error that our body doesn't come from God, but came from natural selection and, fit, and, and survival of the fittest and mutations. And that's all we have is, is nature. The second error um, is Gnosticism. Gnosticism, the Greek word for Gnosticism is, is knowledge. You hear of a, a diagnosis or a prognosis or diagnosis is wisdom. And there, this is even effective today, there's people who believe that, well, my body's evil, but my soul's good. So when we die, um, our, our, our soul is freed from our evil body. And there's people that believe that today. So some people believe, well, I believe that we're angels in heaven. Uh, some of that's influences because the body's bad. And so in spite of this, that God made our bodies wonderful, he made all our bodies to be fearfully and wonderfully made, there's these errors here, that, that we, our body's just an accident of naturalistic, naturalistic processes, evolution, or that the body is evil, and that, and that when we die, the body will be done away with. And so in talking about bodies, this is what St. Paul says. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? 
who is in you. So our body, the Holy Spirit, inhabits our body. Um, and you have received from God. You are not your own. You are therefore bought with a price. Now, there's a lot of people say it's my body. Well, actually, it's not. It's God's body, and your body is bought with a price. It's not your body to do with it as you wish. It's another lie we hear today. It's God's body. God, God made it. Uh, and therefore, honor God with your what? Your body. So body is a gift, and there's gifts that we do with our body, interaction with each other, and in our, and, and, and our relationships with our relationship with our spouses. And so, once again, God is our body is a place where the Holy Temple resides. And so we come to Jesus' death and resurrection, and we're very familiar with that. But notice Jesus doesn't discard his body, but rather uh, he dies and he rises again with a new and more glorious body. His body is transformed. And the reason why that's important is because that's sort of a, the, a prototype. That's sort of a, a something of the firstborn for us, that we will have resurrected bodies in heaven. Uh, we, we will not lose our body, but we'll have a new and glorious body in heaven. And Jesus... Uh, his, his resurrection shows that his body is transformed to something glorious. In my previous city in East Peoria, the city cemetery it was in a district called Fond du Lac, and, and th there's a there's a big cemetery there, and of course did a lot of funerals there. And I was in Kiwanis, and in our Kiwanis groups, we we do monthly field trips. So we went to the new building, district building there by the cemetery, and, and the secretary was telling us they were in the process of taking. All the, all the caskets and all the burials and moving it from the books ba dating back to 1830s and put it into digitized forms, okay? So putting everything in a computer. And I knew the lady because she was a secretary. She worked with my wife. And, and she goes, I just can't figure it out. And she said, when we were going through all the plots, there are people, their caskets only had hands and feet and arms and legs. It just didn't make sense. Their bodies weren't there, but yet it was buried. And it doesn't make sense to us. We just can't figure out why somebody would bury their hand or their foot or their leg or or their arm, and, and it's, it's, there, there's funerals, uh, there's, there's burial places, they have, they bought lots. And so a after Kiwanis left, I came up to her and said, I can explain to you. Well, you can explain to me why people buried their arms and legs and feet and hands and appendices? I said, yeah. I said, well, in the 1830s and 40s and 50s and 60s, and of course, probably today, most people are Christians, and they buried their, their appendices, and they buried their hands and feet and arms because they believed in the resurrection of the what? The dead. And that was a way to honor those, those parts. And so sometimes people, they reopen the grave and they put their body in there after they died, or maybe they're buried someplace else, but it's all a way of honoring and showing that they believe in the what? the resurrection of the dead. So even at grave sites, we say, God, keep these remains until the day of the resurrection of all flesh. And so there they were honoring their bodies as a gift of God, uh, that their bodies were gifts from God. And so God has given us our body, and it's, it's not our own. It belongs to him. And one day for us believers, we will be resurrected um, from the dead with that body. And so I'm going to shift a little bit here. And so Jesus meets with Nicodemus at night. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He doesn't want to see See, with Jesus during the day, I call him Nick at night. Get it, Nick at night? And so, um, and so they're talking about eternal life and stuff, and so read that verse with me. Now, there, don't interpret the flesh to be the body. Interpret the flesh. When Jesus says flesh, when the Bible talks about flesh, it's talking about our old sinful nature. So, Jesus says our old sinful nature gives birth to the sinful nature we inherited from Adam and Eve all the way down through your parents, my parents, to me, and to our children and our grandchildren. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Sinful nature gives birth to sinful nature. But spirit gives birth to the spirit. Um, that's a sinful flesh. Um, let me back up a little bit. Saint, um, David said this, Surely I was sinful from the time my mother conceived me. I was sinful from the time I was born. David said that. And so, for us believers, we're born again. Now, now Nicodemus is having a hard time with this. Jesus said, Nicodemus must be born again. And Nicodemus saying, um, I can't go back into mom. This doesn't make sense to me. No offense. And Jesus is talking about a spiritual rebirth again. Can you all read the verse with me? For you did not... Okay, so... In faith in Christ, we receive a new spirit, and we're born again. And that's very different from our flesh. We have, we have a spirit of God that lives within us, and it's not a slave to sin. Now, I want to go back to this whole um, 
flesh to sin, uh, our flesh, our sinful nature, and we're slaves to sin. We can't help doing it. And there's three ways it's shown. One way is selfishness. You know what selfishness is? I think about me first and you next. No, not really. Selfishness thinks about me first and maybe you 18th. Selfishness is I take care of myself. You know what the false trinity is? Me, myself, and who? I. That's a false trinity. Um, what's the middle letter in sin? And pride? I. Selfishness, I only think about myself and my needs and my concerns. I really don't care about you. I only think about me and my family. You guys don't count. And that's selfishness. Um, by nature, we're selfish people. I always go back to this when I think of selfishness. I think of Star Wars, The New Hope. I remember many years ago. That's sort of me. And, and there's Luke Skywalker and Han Solo. They're getting ready to fight the evil forces, the evil empire. And Han Solo got his money. He's going to leave. And Luke Skywalker said, take care of yourself, Han. That's what you're best at. That's selfishness. Take care of yourself, Han. That's what you're best at. And so there's selfishness. And then, then there's also, uh, when I think of selfishness, there's passion of the flesh. Well, what are some passions of the flesh? Well, let's just go. Let's start with lust. The passion of flesh, an attractive person. There, there's, there's sexual sin. There's lust. Now, you heard that Hollywood's on strike, right? Now, I'm, I'm sure there's some decent, honest people being hurt, but my opinion is please stay on strike. Because not a whole lot of good that comes from Hollywood. Someone said that Hollywood movies are the polluters of the world. They're on strike now. Please stay on strike. Uh, there's passions of flesh. And the only reason they make those movies is because there's willing people to buy tickets to go ahead and look at that. You get the idea. But there's passions of the flesh. Or, or the other thing is greed. You know what greed is? Wanting what? More for me. Somebody once asked, hang on, somebody once asked Andrew Carnegie how much is enough. And he's like worth $4 billion back in the 1850s. That's like 40 times now. That's like $160 billion. They asked him how much was enough. And you know what he said? Always a little what? That's greed. That's a passion of the flesh. Um, I like Luther's definition of greed. Greed is neglect of God and neighbor. You see, poor people can be greedy. Middle income can be greedy. And rich people can be greedy because greedy is me neglecting God and my neighbor with what I have. See, greed is just wanting more. It's me neglecting others. Oh, what is that? Well, there's, well, there's lust and there's greed. And a passion of the flesh is gluttony. And I get all stuff for myself. I collect all stuff for me. I'm materialism. I like, I like having the best and the, and the greatest, even though it affects others. And those are passion of the flesh. And the last one, it sounds rather odd, but it's apathy. I don't care. Um, somebody once said, apathy, apathy is a Midwesterner's way of saying stick it. I, I, just, I just don't care. I don't care about others. I only care about myself. Matter of fact, apathy to me is neglect. Yeah, it doesn't matter to me. That, that doesn't bother me. And that's a sin of the flesh. I'm going to sit this one out. I'm sitting this out. And we become slaves to these things. These, these are, this is the flesh that we have. But we know that for us believers that Christ died for us. He died to put those sinful things away. Uh, we're given, those things are given to death. We have a new life in the Holy Spirit. Those things. By the Spirit, we are God's children. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. This is by the power of the Holy Spirit. This isn't something that you kick up yourself, you and I really try at. This is the Holy Spirit working in us through his word and through, through his, his sacraments and his power. Just as Christ loved, up, loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, then also says this, in the way of the Spirit says this, we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. We can all relate to suffering. We can all relate to suffering. Why? Well, that helps crucify our flesh, and that helps us sharpen our spirit to what's really important. Um, we share in his sufferings and his glory. Do you know, do you remember President James Madison? You know what I'm talking about? And James Madison on his deathbed, he's getting ready to die, and a friend came to visit him on his deathbed and said, President Madison, how are you doing? He goes, I'm doing quite well. Matter of fact, I'm doing remarkably well. I myself, I'm doing great. I love life. I know heaven's my home. I'm doing great. But unfortunately, he looked at his friend and says, but the building I live in is not doing great. The roof is dilapidated. The foundations are cracked. The walls are falling in. And this body, I'm afraid I'm going to have to, it's going to be no longer livable. I'm going to have to leave it, but I'm going to go to a new and glorious home. Now, of course, Jane Madison was talking about what? His new body in heaven. So we share in his sufferings that we might also share in his glory. You see, the whole thing with our body is that one day we'll be resurrected and our sufferings will share in his glory. 
this sounds somewhat odd, but you know when a person dies after they've been dealing with a disease, that's God's way of totally healing them. But wait, 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 but they're dead. No, their old body, the body of death is dead. Their spirit and soul is alive, and they're waiting what? The new body and the resurrection. God is totally healing them. When my mother, whose health was failing for, for weeks and months, and she died, God healed her. And the old body is done away with, and she awaits a new body in heaven for us. So friends in Christ, God's given us our body. He calls us to crucify our flesh, to repent, believe in baptism, believe in the Lord's Supper, receive his blessing. We live in a newness of the Spirit. Even when we suffer, we live in a newness of the Spirit, loving one another as Christ loved us. So with all that in mind, catch this here, the body and soul. Here's our closing thought. Can you all read it with me? Let us ever walk with Jesus. Follow his example pure. Flee the world which would deceive us and to sin our souls allure. Ever in his footsteps treading, body here yet soul above, full of faith and hope and love. Let us do our Father's bidding. Faithful Lord, abide with me. Savior, lead, I follow thee. And all God's people say,